welcome to Elaine and Ron have a response to... Sean and Carter have a podcast, Sandman, and Legend of Korra. <laughs> now, isn't that a funny coincidence? <laughs> oh. My name is Elaine. And I'm Ron. <laughs> so, Sean and Carter had a podcast. Got a bit long this yeah. this week. <laughs> yeah, they, they challenged us with a two-parter. Mm, we're up for the challenge. Actually, yeah, but... the truth is is that most of it, some of it, we're not going to respond to necessarily because of spoiler concerns. So we're gonna we're gonna keep it to only some parts of it this time. Yeah, we're we're gonna start with part one, which was SCHP thirty six, and maybe leave the cabin in the woods talk to another week. Yes, because we want to. I think we're gonna respect that. Um, it's it's a that movie is a movie best served. Um, in, 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 without spoilers. I, can't, I was trying to say ignorance. And I'm just like, <laughs> anyway. I, I, was, I was like, served cold? Serve, <laughs> is, is Cabin in the Woods best served cold? It's possible. Yeah. Um, so I, I did see it. I'll just throw that out there. And I really, really enjoyed it. So That's a thumb up from Ron. And Elaine's yep. thumb is going to remain horizontal because Elaine is probably not going to see this movie for at least a year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, what what uh, what did you want to respond to from SCHP? Well, the first thing I wanted to uh, call out was the Valve Handbook. Thank you, gentlemen, for giving me the link to the most fascinating and funny. But also for me, it was um, I thought about it for a while. I I even shared it with some of my artistic friends, and so the Valve Handbook, um, the Valve Company. For those who are not aware, they have this sort of tongue-in-cheek, but I also think they they mean it seriously. They, they might actually hand this to their new employees to help somebody integrate themselves into a work environment that does not have a hierarchy. So that would be a challenge. Yeah, I, I can't quite imagine a professional environment like that, it, it definitely sounds cool to me. It could be cool, but I could also see it being uh, extremely intimidating because um, I think most of us are well acclimated to almost giving in to the idea that there has to be a hierarchy, a manager system, some level of authority structure in any company or work place environment because then how else would we be getting things done herp yeah. herp herp but, so i mean but if you look at what sean and carter do if you look at what you and i are doing it's kind of the same thing it's like hey i've got a project do you want to come help with it and we kind of you know just sort of migrate around and which is why valve states in the handbook very clearly the reason that they have this working scheme is so that creativity can flourish they have a really great line in there that i've i've uh i need to go back and probably copy it out or make myself a poster or hang it up on my wall or basically the statement is is that for that sort of mind to flourish you have to let go you can't just you can't throttle somebody down and and tell them where they should put their creativity. It has to work the other way. A creative person needs to be in charge and own, have ownership of what they choose to do, or else they're going to kind of squander their own ability. Yep. So. Yeah. the The other thing that I found cool about it was the peer review process. Mm -hmm. So in, in my work, we have a three sixty degree review process as well it's it's informal it's not documented but you basically review your peers uh, or upward feedback on like your supervisors and in you know in the right teams it works really well it works better than you know formal supervisor feedback yeah so. actually I've always been intimidated no matter I mean I've been asked to give feedback about my superiors and of course they say it's anonymous but I've always, I've always been afraid to give proper feedback about my superiors because no matter how many times somebody tells me, oh, this won't have any repercussions, oh, you know, you'll be anonymous, they'll never know who you are. Yeah. Um, it just so happens that I work in a, a unique enough 
environment that I think that's false. <laughs> I yeah, think I think sure. people can be identified by what their concerns are. So like if I have a bone to pick with my boss about the way my cubicle is facing, I bet my boss already knows that. And if I were to be honest and be like, my boss is, you know, my boss would be like, hmm. Elaine yeah. gave me a bad review. I don't like Elaine anymore. And he, so if everybody was on an even level and it didn't really mean anything, I think I'd be much more inclined to be both effective with my critique, maybe a little bit more fair with my critique, and then less worried if there was going to be repercussions. So I think Valve, I want to go there. I want to see their company. Yeah, I was going to say, if we're ever thinking about like a career cho- change, you know, we, we've got practice in this type, kind of environment. Oh, I have a random question. Okay. Oh, you, you just you just touched it right on the head. I thought about this earlier, and I, I wanted to know, in a scenario where you would have no choice but to stop the career, if you can define your career, um, cause some people can't define if they have a career and I respect that. So, um, but if you had to stop the career you currently have and you would need to start a new one, what career choice would you pursue? So, and this is also assuming that all is well, like you're not homeless, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a good, it's a good condition, sort of like not a regret, but I feel yeah. like sometimes people always kind of hold on to these second careers. Oh, this was this would have been the career I would have done if I wasn't in this line of career. Yeah. So, yeah. what what do you think? Well, I, it's pretty easy for me because, you know, you, you've seen a lot of the stuff that I do as hobby, which I put in almost as much effort as a second career. So, I, you know, since I was able to play my first video game at like whatever age I was, eight or nine I, I wanted to program video games or mm-hmm. I should say I wanted to design video games so I would clearly uh, go into that field of work uh, mm. the, yeah the only only reason I didn't because I, w- I went to school for computer science and programming and when I was in college um, I was able to get an internship doing some business programming and the video game market was kind of in a slump there was really nothing going on unless you were you know in Silicon Valley, I guess, probably not that much different today, but I didn't feel like I could go out there and get a career. And then as soon as I got my first job, things like uh, Quake and everything started blowing up. So I kind of missed it by a year or two, but but that's where I would go. Mm. I think I have a similar answer as that, but one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm trying to go through a career change. So the way that I approach that is I have my day job, <laughs> so to speak, and I yeah. treat I treat my interests or the things that I would seriously like to be my career as my career, or I'm trying to step over to that. So I can't even say that that would be my answer because I feel like that would it doesn't apply. Like I am actively pursuing things like programming and and um, wanting to move on to my next career. If if I couldn't do that one, or the one I'm at right now, I'd have to say that I probably would choose a career in um, counseling or uh, helping people. <laughs> and, oh. and yeah, because, career counseling. Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like um, I don't know. Just you know, people I think of counselors or therapists or stuff like that. Oh wow! Um, I. I wouldn't, so no offense meant, I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have thought it would be something like, you know, art or something like that. Well, it's always something that has, I've always noticed that that could have easily have been my career track. I just didn't go that way. Yep. So it's always, it's kind of, it's something that I've always thought about myself and like, you know, I probably could have spent, and this is lots of things about my personality that I guess never make it to video or Whatever, but I probably could have spent and done really well in um, that sort of field. Mm-hmm. I just never went there, and I don't know if I will. So, yeah, because I have well, m- more interests in that, like you said, the things that I hobby and the things that I pursue. So, well, I, I'm I'm sure a lot of listeners are currently going through, you know, trying to decide if what their career is going to be. They're probably in high school and don't even 
have have any real idea of what's out there as a career so yeah do you think you could give him any advice um i do i think i could give them any advice (laughs) wow i'm being mean to him (laughs) (laughs) no here's here how about this i'll go this route if i could give counselor if i could give any advice uh, based off of the feelings that i had when i left high school is that um, if you're going to continue to pursue ed- education, have an open mind. You're gonna, people are going to ask you to be like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, that's, I don't like that mentality, really. Um, yeah, you, in some respects, you know, you're in high school, you're pretty much grown. But you're not yet, I mean, you've been in education, so. Well, here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. If you don't know what you want to be, if you don't have a really deep passion for something, don't go, I would suggest not going into it for something like money or for something like it's what your parents did. Mm -hmm. I would say go, so the first thing I would say if you're graduating high school is go to college, get at least your basics, get your math, get your science, make sure that your credits are going to be transferable Mm -hmm. or likely that they're going to be transferable. And then decide, you know, you can decide what you're going to do as a career. Uh, I know a lot of people that went to school for X and then graduated and ended up doing Y. So You know what I would say my advice is, because you just clarified this for me, is if you're going into college and you need to pick a major, go ahead and, and go and do the general stuff just like you said, and go to the departments that you're interested in before you sign up for them. Yeah. And, and talk to them and get the real deal. Because... Yeah. So, you know, my biggest challenge when I was in college was that every time that I tried to find my place, I did it backwards. I I went to the place and said, nope, this is not me. And then I just switched. (laughs) Anyway, um, you had a question that you wanted to ask Sean and Carter, which I think is kind of funny. Well, and it, yeah, it kind of ties in with what we're just talking about, too. So both of those guys were able to rattle off the number of kids that were in their high school graduating class like it was just common knowledge. And I, I'm wondering, like, Elaine, is this something that people just know like, or just remember <laughs> how many people are in their school? Yes, everybody knows. You're the oh. only one who doesn't. Yeah, I have no, I have no idea how many kids were in, <laughs> in my school. It, it just seemed like something I never needed to know. Now, I know that in my high school, I had like at least more than 900, but less than 1,000. And I remember that because um, I graduated in 1999. So like there were just lots of nines all over the place. And I just remember that. So, Oh, is it, is that a considered a large school or a small school or? Well, I would consider it a large high school, but I, you know, maybe those who have larger school districts than my own would consider it small. Okay, because mm-hmm. here's my thought process. <laughs> when I went to elementary school, there was two parallel classes of about 30 each. So that's 60. And then there was like three elementary schools that fed into our junior high. So that would be 180. And then there was like three or four junior highs that fed into our high school. So we were probably like, what, 600, if I did the math right in my head? Well, there you know. Now you know. Maybe that's how they know. Yeah, I don't know. That's, how do they that's... know that? Did somebody tell that? Did, maybe they were concerned about what their ranking were. That's why a lot of people know how many are in their senior class based off of their class rank. Oh, I don't even... Oh, you mean like their personal rank as far yeah. as like... Oh, you know, there's the valid Victorian, right? Yeah. And then you have a class rank and everybody got one. By the way, I was right in the middle. Maybe a little bit above the middle. I was not an overachiever. Mm -mm. No? Nope. (laughs) Uh, Um, Yeah, I did did well. I guess we could leave it at that. So, yeah, there you go. I had had another thought, but now it's gone. It wasn't important. What about those angry birds? Yeah, I'm so glad that Carter brought this up because I actually was going to, I was going to mention this as a throwaway last week and uh, decided to leave it out, but I'm I'm a big fan of Angry Birds. I've, Angry Birds has traveled with me across a couple different iOS devices and uh, I just wanted to bring that up, but I wanted, I did want to see what device Carter is playing it on, 
if it's iPad or iPhone. And uh, I wanted to, to complain a little bit about my experience on my iPhone. I can answer one of those questions. Okay. Carter plays it on both. He said oh. that when he plays it on his iPhone, he plays casually. And when he plays it on his iPad, he gets super serious. Okay, well then I wonder then I wonder if he's using the same account or stats because like I had played it on the iPad. I played the first game, the seasons, the Rio, and I had got all the stars, all the trophies, all that good stuff. But then when I got my own that was on my wife's iPad actually. <laughs> when I got when I got my own iPhone, I was like, I don't want to start over and do it all again. So I've just now recently got uh space. Uh, Angry Birds Space on my iPhone only, and I'm really enjoying the, you know, the the gravity of the whole. I've watching. heard it's good. I've heard it's very good. Yeah, it's it's just a cool dimension added to these these sort of slingshot games. But the the thing I'm having trouble with on my iPhone is some of the levels, they actually zoom out too far, mm -hmm. so it's really hard to tell like which bird is in the sling, and you can't really zoom in all the time. I have the same complaint about Angry Birds, coincidentally <laughs> enough. Huh. But basically, um, I've only had, I've only gotten to use an iPad for about a week. I tested, I got, um, I, my work supplied me with one. And okay. um, off I went and I, I had plenty of downtime, so I was able to log into my own iTunes account and I was able to play Angry Birds and it was the first time that I played Angry Birds and it was a wonderful experience. I enjoyed it. I didn't know why it was huge, but it was fun so I could see it having a big following. Yeah. And yeah. then I tried playing it on a phone. <laughs> I I didn't play more than one game or one or two games on the phone before I said, "Nope, this is a tablet game. This is not a phone game." Because yeah. The tablet offers so much more precision, and the phone, I needed to see more. And so I, after experiencing the tablet, I wasn't about to go back in small little screen. Just didn't translate well. Yeah, it's hard It's hard to aim on the phone, like you said, the precision. Because like, as soon as my finger leaves the, the surface, sometimes the angle shifts, and mm -hmm. then the bird shoots where I didn't want it, and that frustrates me. So um, the, the other reason I wanted to mention Angry Birds, though, is because uh, I think Sean mentioned that, like, you know, Carter's achievements in Angry Birds is like the last Starfighter. You know? <laughs> he did. And, and so I spent I spent a couple hours downloading clips of the last Starfighter and trying to see if I could edit in a little a little joke into this uh, into this video cast that we're doing. Uh, I did not succeed to do it convincingly. However, I found something that I thought Carter and Sean would be interested in. And it's basically somebody back in the 90s created a Last Starfighter, the musical. <laughs> so I've got the link here that you can put in the description, and they can go check it out and listen to some of the songs. But I thought that was quite funny. Oh, well, then I'll make sure that that's in the info. Yeah. I'll go check it out myself right after this podcast. Oh, <laughs> video cast. We don't have a podcast. All right. Yeah. Well, we have a... A viewer, because this is a video cast, even though we don't have anything to view. We have a listener who goes by the nickname DB Moulton, and he had quite a bit of conversion with us, conversation with us. But yeah, I was. I felt honored. I, I was thrilled. So thank you for being <laughs> so interactive with us. Um, that, well, that's a hint to everybody else listening, by the way. Leave us a comment. We love you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Peeps and dudes, leave a comment. So basically, um, D.B. Moulton, one of his comments, because there were several, but one of his comments was that he loves M.C. Escher, and so does, oh... Ninja Kitty 121. Ninja Kitty 121. They both like M.C. Escher. Popular choice. And uh, he wanted to know if I had ever seen any pictures from the Wharton Escherich Museum, and I have not unfortunately. Oh, but it's something else to research. That's that's the fun of this is like, you know, it based I, I don't know if inspiring is the right word, but like inspiring the audience, then they inspire us with a comment and then that leads somewhere else and then pretty soon we're like looking up MC Escher the musical. Yeah. Oh my gosh, don't oh no. 
Uh, <laughs> I hope I forget that before I actually search for that. Um, uh oh. The okay. next thing would <laughs> be really funny. Uh, what's with all the Facebook hate from you and Sean and Carter have a podcast, guys? You gotta leverage that social media these days. Without Facebook, the Landcast wouldn't have reached the audience it has today. Is another comment that he had, and his third comment. And we'll respond to that. His third comment was, are you posting these episodes on iTunes yet? <laughs> Ron, do you have any well, thoughts? So the, the first thought is, Landcast is the podcast that D.B. Moulton does. And I believe Sean's going to make a couple, either a couple or regular guest appearances on that show. So we should probably give a, a shout out to the Landcast. Yes. As well. Um, Information so that, in the down below yeah, yeah. Back to Facebook. Um, I don't use it. I don't have any plan to ever use it. And it's mainly because I don't want to be, A, connected to all those people that I can't count back from high school. Um, not that I don't love them and have good memories of them, but it's just, I don't, I don't need to like rehash stuff anymore with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and but what this, about all the people who didn't know you in high school, but that would love to have you to have a Facebook so that they can conveniently interact with you and have access to your social media? But all they have to do is comment on my videos and <laughs> play Isn't my YouTube good enough. Play, play my Minecraft maps and and Twitter me, and I I, I don't need the right. the Facebook. But but the other reason too is like there's this expectation that if somebody sends you a friend request or whatever. And if you don't accept it or if you take someone off, that it's like a it's like a real personal attack. So I've seen a lot of drama created because of that, which is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's so, ridiculous. Yeah. And, you know, spam and uh, I, I just it's not for me. But right. Here's here's what I would say about it. Um, the reason that I, I just recently not even three weeks ago, deleted my Facebook account. I, in fact, I don't know if it was three or two. It wasn't that long ago. And the reason was is because um, I do take p a part of social media. So, uh, you know, here I am on YouTube, um, and I have a Twitter now. And I resisted Twitter for such a long time, but when I realized that so many people communicated on it, as soon as I signed up for Twitter... I realized that I liked Facebook even less just because of, like, Twitter, it was the social connection, the quickness, the, the sort of streaming thought that I liked about Facebook. But what I don't like about Facebook is, um, again, what you, you were talking, the expectations, the drama. Not that drama can't happen on the internet and other places, but it seems like Facebook does a very good job of uh, really kind of cultivating drama. Yeah, it, it, it's. I think it's people. I don't think it's Facebook. I think Facebook's a good tool. Like, you know, I have family members that basically are, you know, daily uploading pictures of what they're doing and, and sharing that with, you know, aunts and uncles that normally wouldn't see them. Mm -hmm. But it's just not, uh, just not for me. So yeah. And the other, the other reason that I kind of stay away from Facebook is because I, I've been a little. Uneasy, and this is funny because I, I know people are going to say Google does the same sort of stuff, and they do. Every site generally these days changes their privacy policies and everything like that. But I don't know. It was I was interacting with Facebook during a, a particularly not great time when when I felt like they were just changing the privacy and linking me up with things and doing mm -hmm. things that I never gave my permissions about and then I read some stuff up on Mark Zuckerman and I just thought about it and I'm like you know I'm not really I'm not really into this particular site and that's just basically it yeah. no big deal there'll be other sites that will leverage if we feel like we need to leverage them and yes he's absolutely right if we don't leverage the popular sites the, the work that we do here will be under viewed or perhaps not viewed at all. And it's, I guess it's just a choice. You know? Well, I, I, I think that we have at least a small audience, Sean and Carter, that will, that will hopefully always view these videos. <laughs> and, and really like, that's, you know, the main reason that I'm, that I'm doing this mm -hmm. is to just, you know, have a more thorough response uh, and share some other topics that I know, people like ninja kitty and and others will be interested in so, so yes i have many reasons that could be a whole nother segment on another show is why yeah. am i doing this we could talk about that but yeah. we can move on for now 
Yeah. So, so we uh, I, well, let's answer his last question, which is, are they on iTunes yet? Short yes. answer is no. No, they are not. Yes, no, they are not. <laughs> we don't. We don't have. Um, there's a specific way that you you post things. That's that's why we joke about the fact that we we don't have a podcast because literally we don't have. <laughs> we don't have one. This is a video cast response to a podcast, and maybe one day we'll we'll uh, we will become experienced enough that we will branch out into a podcast. But for now, we're comfortable right here with this little response thing that we're doing, and we will let you know as soon as we broadcast a podcast for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if somebody were to say, "Hey, give me the M- MP3. I'll host it on my server and take care of all the." mechanics for you i would be open to it but i uh eh, one thing at a time well yeah we're we're taking we're taking a stroll ron and i are learning as we go along all right yeah Yeah. so the the only other topic that i had noted um in the the part one of schp 35 or i guess i guess that would be schp 36 um was they talked about Marble Hornets for quite a long time. And I wanted to, um, I just wanted to actually give a sort of a tangential shout out to um, Sean and his Five Things News channel mm-hmm. uh, because he had a cool video that I did and that I really enjoyed called Molasses Hornets, where he basically took a clip from the episode and he slowed it down and showed it to us frame by frame so we could see some of the. You know some of the uh, things, the subliminal things that they put in those videos in the background. Okay. And and I thought that was very intriguing. Like watching that, you know, made me excited to to hear about the series. Maybe I'll go check that out. Is it scary? Um, I I don't think it's scary. I mean, does it have jump scares? Well, no, because it's slowed down frame by frame. Like. Like you, you'll you'll understand the concepts of how it could be scary if it was sped up. Mm-hmm. But I get yeah. it. All it, right. It was just it was cool because again he's taking it to the next level. So maybe I'll go check that out. That might be a format that I could enjoy. So I will go. Thank you for telling me about that. I will go look. And everybody cool. else, if you like Marble Hornets or curious about it, or you're like me, a super huge wimp, maybe you can go check it out too. On to our main. Probably our main topic of discussion. We yeah. assigned it you homework, viewers. And if you took on the Sandman challenge, this is your moment of glory. Yeah, it was it was a nice challenge. I think it was a I think it was an appropriate amount of pages. I did not feel overwhelmed by the assignment and if people if you had if you thought that that was too much to consume two volumes at a time was too much please let us know and maybe we'll consider just doing one volume at a time yeah okay and if you are interested in wa- in watching or I should say reading this with us and you have not picked it up yet um, I was able to find uh, I did not own own these comics in advance so I was able to find a volume called the annotated Sandman mm-hmm. uh, it contains the first 20 issues it is a ginormous book i i cannot take it on on my planes with me every week so i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to do my homework on the weekends and then save my notes till we record um but if if that's not an option for you i found uh the dc comics comicsology app you can get individual episodes for a dollar 99 each that's which, great yeah so we'll put the link to that in the description um the the book that I got, I saw it, I think it was on um barnesandnoble.com for like thirty bucks. Um, but if you buy it in the store it was like fifty. So you know, just, just to set people's expectations. I am now. I'm really, really thrilled that it's uh, it's available online for two dollars an issue. That's amazing. So th- that's a lot more affordable than th- yeah. you could hope. So like even if you're like, Oh, I got pennies and I you know, oh, it's so worth it. Go check yeah. that out. Um, just, yeah, I don't. I, mean, I don't use that app, so I'm not exactly sure what all it's entailed. But it's out there, and it's. I, I it's, might go check it out. Maybe I need to get into some downloadable comics. Whew. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Once you start, you're gonna. <laughs> I'll be. I'll be addicted. I like to talk about comics all the time. Did, did you Did you collect comics in in broad strokes like yeah. ever? 
No, actually, okay. this is this is the first and only comic I've ever collected. Oh, oh wow! Oh, break breaks the heart a little bit, but what a good one to collect, says me. Yeah, so, maybe, maybe I'll I'll have to talk about my comic experiences someday, but. But not today. Not today. So let's start with what the homework was. Okay, the two issues that we assigned was Sleep of the Just and Imperfect Hosts. I just oh wanted. yes. Yep. Basically, um, let's talk about let's just talk about issue one. Hello, welcome to the world of Sandman, <laughs> and here we have magic and dark and evil people, and it is apparently. 1920s ish I believe it starts in 1916 and what we're treated to is um, about 70 years this story that takes place over 70 years and the way that um, the narrators choose to impart narrators narrator um, basically we follow the lives of maybe five regular people and how the events of that happened in this issue affected them and we're also introduced to um, a very bad name man a very bad man named Burgess who uh, basically wants to live forever he he knows magic he does magic um, he's very evil and he wants more power so he endeavors to trap death and then he fails and base yeah. and this is how we this is how we meet dream and dream is uh endless he doesn't age he he's he's not mortal he's he has a human form a humanoid form but we don't know much about him except for the fact that he's basically trapped by this human and he has to sit there for 70 years yeah we we actually we don't even know who he is for quite a while i think um I think like near the end of the first book, we find out who he is, right? Yes, we learn about Dream by what what goes wrong when he's, you know, when if he were free, maybe this stuff wouldn't be happening. So I, I guess I'm I'm looking yeah. for we learn about him through what is missed if he is captured, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I I have a, qu a question about this, but the one thing I would also say is so apparently Dream is Death's younger brother, right? That's what he said. Yeah, I think he, he said, said that in issue two. So, but he, oh, okay. I'm sorry. It's all right. So, thoughts about issue one? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I have. Um, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I was. I was. For some reason, I had thought that I read this before, but I. I obviously must not have read the first one because I didn't remember the whole progression of year by year by year, which which I found really effective. Mm -hmm. um, at first I was like, oh, wait, I thought this was modern day. Um, but the other thing was that the wild dream is captured. And did we, did we give a spoiler warning already? Uh, we must have. Well. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. Hey, guys, there's spoilers. <laughs> yeah. So, so while, while we'll do he's... do better. While, while he's... No, no, that's okay. Mm -hmm. While he's captured, um, people begin... Uh, being affected by a sleeping sickness or what what they call a sleeping sickness mm -hmm. and I thought it was it was interesting that some people are um, basically don't wake up and some people are unable to go to sleep it's like one or the other yes yeah and I'm, I'm wondering like okay what is it about the person that makes them one or the other I think uh, yeah that is left largely undefined but I wondered that too like if somebody I wondered that, and I wondered why it was only a period of two years. Um, but first things first, I think it had to do with what they were doing at the time. So I got the impression that the little girl who fell asleep while reading through the looking glass um, mm -hmm. stayed asleep because she was asleep. And so there was no, the, the feeling was that there was no catalyst to actually wake her up. Whatever used to wake a person up no longer worked. Okay. Um, and then the other thing that I saw, you know, the man who could not go to sleep, mm -hmm. um, I got the feeling that his story was being told because he was starting to go to sleep and he wanted to specifically dream his special dream spot, which was a literally a castle in the clouds. Mm -hmm. But that moment that he was reaching that point, the power snapped, basically, and he was suffering from whiplash, 
or the okay. fact that he couldn't dream anymore because like it's almost like I don't, yeah maybe I like this that is really the connection was severed i like that idea yeah and that's that's the impression so he was a walking zombie because he had no dreams to have which was really yeah. sad and yeah. it, yes. it was it was kind of weird though because they they made it sound to me like people over the course of two years were more and more people were slowly getting this sickness but it wasn't everyone no and and that's where i'm like not exactly sure i, I think later when when we hear about how what happened to dreams world while he was away maybe that explains it makes it. a little bit more sense it reveals yeah. a little bit more but definitely in issue one that's not clear what's yeah. clear is is that that only happened for a short period of time and then what for whatever reason the sleeping sickness stopped and those yeah. who those who suffered from it suffered through their entire life it was yeah. like a permanent thing that happened to them but then after a period of about two or three years passed nobody else was succumbing to the sleeping sickness and so that's an interesting point yeah um, do, you, do you know like why do you have any theories of why that happen like in the in the panel that we're presented with um nobody knew who was captured who was in the in the bubble and and then pretty much the same year that it was revealed who that it was dream is the year that the sleeping sickness seemed to stop affecting people yeah i think it's very vague in issue one i think that when you're sitting there it, uh when he's in his he's literally in a a glass crystal bubble dream cannot get out and they realize that when people's dreams or the way that they interact with dreams is messed up they're like oh it's dream for sure but <laughs> here's a funny point about that too there's a whole panel showing him they opened up the book and there's the guy with the gas mask on yeah and it's like well wouldn't that have been obvious when you took his gas mask and we kind of skipped over that part when dream was captured um three items of his were were seized immediately one is a amulet with a ruby in it one is a helmet that looks like a gas mask and then the third one is a bag of sand yeah the the helmet i was i was not, not really thrilled about it because it looked kind of like a, I don't know, like, you know, some Star Wars cheap alien. I think you'll you know, get used like... to it, but I think I think it's also something that makes him more iconic. I mean, yeah. I don't know if I would like Dream the same, and this is just me reflecting on what I understand. Um, I don't think I would like him this, the same if it was a different style of helmet. You yeah. know, <laughs> like, I kind of I kind of, I kind of like it, but I can see why it's also weird. Yeah, so... so so I think in, in book one, he's captured. There's Their guards are given you know, amphetamines. They're always kept awake. They're not allowed to, to fall asleep while they're guarding him. Mm -hmm. And the, the people that captured him, don't, they don't know what to do with him. They're like, they try to talk to him. They try to make deals with him. But he just kind of sits there, and they're afraid to let him go. He they're doesn't afraid say to... anything. He just sits yeah. there. They don't give him. He gives them absolutely no information, no satisfaction, nothing. He just sits there and yeah. waits. And that's that's how it ends. Is he's sitting there waiting every once in a while. This is also when we get introduced to the way that Dream speaks. And yeah. an interesting illustration choice of this particular comic is everybody else has a white bubble with black text, but Dream has a black black bubble with white text and it it reads very it reads across to me as this deep voice and i don't know why i choose that but it just really changes like here something is talking to you and it is not like anything you've ever encountered yeah i i think the other thing i would say is as far as i know none of the characters in the first book will continue on except for dream into the other books Mm -hmm. So it, it's an interesting, um, I, they basically use the whole first issue to set up Dream without really, without really giving you any information about him, but by watching the lives of the people that have him captured, it's, it's really a cool effect. What, what would the world be like with the loss of Dream, basically, yeah. is that, that's issue one. So issue two, Dream is still captured. And the evil man who captured Dream by mistake, but didn't release him, said, Oh, he'll still be useful to me. I will keep him right there. Has a problem. Because his magic circle 
sort of um, goes bad and his second in command steals all his stuff. He steals the amulet, he steals the helmet, and he steals the sand. And he runs off with the pretty girl and uh, basically magical war. It, now it is war. And now we get an, another huge swath of time. And basically we learn about the Burgess growing old, um, fighting his second in command, and eventually his second command gets so nervous that he trades off the helmet to a demon and gets protection from him. But then the turnabout of fair play is the woman that he ran off with takes all his stuff, leaves the second in command vulnerable, and second in command dies. Yeah. And then um, the evil man Burgess, uh, Bur- Burgess, Bur- Bur- am I saying his name right? Um, Burgess. Burgess. <laughs> um, basically, he will grow old and die, his worst fear, uh, because Dream will not do anything, won't say anything to him. So Dream is sitting in his basement, literally, and just waiting to get out. And the old man will go down and visit him and be like, you know, you could have helped me, and, and but why did I have to die? I didn't need to die, and then he basically dies on the spot. <laughs> yeah, it, I don't think it. I don't think it's revealed until the second issue. But Dream basically says, you know, you're asking for stuff that can't be given to mortals. And by the way, I don't have that stuff anyway. He does. He says that. He does. So. But he says it to Alex. So Alex is the son. And he was in the first issue as well. Alex was very young in the first issue. You could say that Alex, while he was watching his dad do all this stuff, was pissing his pants. He was scared. <laughs> like, it just shows all these shots of Alex being completely terrified. Um, and in the second issue, Alex is growing up, inherits his father's wealth, maybe is a little bit more jaded, still really scared, I think, of the things that his dad was doing, but it doesn't mean that Alex is a better person. Um and there, there are a couple panels where he's talking about the crazy thing in his basement. He's, he's, he's really worried about Dream. And now we get to see Alex grow old. And Alex is the one going to the basement all the time and, you know, trying to get something out of Dream. And Dream is just really biting. He can't do anything. And he chooses not to do anything. He just waits. Yeah, do you think he... Does, does Dream know what's coming? Like, is he out of time or something because at one point he says soon like, soon i think dream is in touch with 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 power or like if somebody had a power source they can feel it i think dream could feel okay there are these two guards that were always by dream it could be two different people but for over the course of 70 years two guards were kept guarding dream in his crystal bubble <laughs> and <laughs> Um, they were not allowed to sleep, so that means that they had whatever stimulants that they required in order to not fall asleep. Um, Burge, Burgess was really diligent about that, but Alex, who really didn't want to be his father, but was still scared, but um, things were falling apart, the magic stuff went away, uh, the organization went away, but Dream is still sitting in the basement. Um, and so Alex wants to try to get that taken care of, but he's negligent. And the guards became negligent. And so basically, I think what Dream senses is the, the the sleepiness of the guard. He's like, here's my opportunity. Just as soon as one of these two fools doze off, I, I, I have my, my power. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why. I guess they just had to be close to the circle that was keeping Dream in. But there's this really great moment. Um, one of the guards is reading, reading Stephen King's It!, Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the other guard is reading The Sun. <laughs> and the guy who's reading The Sun starts talking about his sex life, bores the crap out of the first guard, and the first guard falls asleep. And what here's something. This is the first taste of power that we understand about Dream, is he somehow gets into, well, not somehow, he's in the dream of the guard, and he the guard is dreaming about being on a beach. So... Dream takes a handful of sand from the dream. Yep. And then he breaks out because of two things. One, somebody accidentally smudged the circle and so they broke the power. And two, um, he's able to get the dream from the sleepy guard 
the dream sand from the sleepy guard. Maybe, I'll have to go back and look at this, but maybe after the circle got smudged, Dream was able to make the guard sleepy? I th- I, th- I got the impression that he, it was just, like you said, negligence. It was bound to happen eventually. Mm-hmm. And, and Dream, by this point, actually was so drained of his power, I don't think he did it. I think he was just waiting to be released and then took advantage of it. Mm-hmm. But okay. but I'm not sure. I well, actually, like I said, I got the annotated version, but I'm purposely not reading any of the annotations. I'm just going to read the panels, and then I'm going to go back and read all the annotations when we're done. So basically, Dream then gets a handful of sand. Well, it's the Sandman. He basically blows this. He breaks out. He blows the sand over everybody. They all pass out. And then, then uh, one of my favorite panels second to favorite panel is when he's basically op- opening the portal when we when we see mm-hmm. him it's this it's a full page panel of just him going and he he's creating the vortex and he's going into it mm-hmm. basically mm-hmm. and then we learn that dream has been sitting there quietly for 70 years and he's pissed <laughs> he's mm-hmm. mad so um first thing he goes and does is he's naked by the way he goes and he jumps through dream time and he goes to different people's dreams and he eats some food, which I found surprising. Yeah, he eats dream food. It's and not he, like he feeds on the dream itself, but like if you're dreaming of food, that's what he eats. And he ate, he was, actually there's a really great little small panel there with him holding a sub sandwich and a turkey leg and he's like <laughs> jogging through and I'm like, I love that panel, that's a great panel. Because um, yep. you're used to him being so serious and then there's this panel of him running with all this food. Um and then the, the, the very next thing he does, his very next concern is to not be naked. So he'll, he just stands there for a moment. And he dreams himself up some robes. Okay. And then he's like, now the third thing is, is my revenge. And I also need my stuff, but I'm going to go get revenge. And yeah. what he does is he catches up with Alex, the son of Burgess. And he basically makes Alex wake from a nightmare over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, like Alex's waking world just becomes a nightmare. He's forever asleep, but he thinks he's waking up. Yeah. And um, I think Dream refers it to as the endless waking. And so is Alex's serving of justice. Yep. Yeah. Then we get to see more of Dream Time. And then we get to see that Dream Time has decayed. We get to understand a little bit more about how Dream interacts with Dream Time about where Dream pulls his power from um, and maybe why some people weren't falling asleep anymore because there's mentions of balance. So at first everything was seriously out of whack because Dream wasn't there to tend to his castle, quite literally. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of rules that we get sort of hinted at and it's it's that balance of power that you mentioned. That's one thing I really like about, you know, fiction that deals with with magic is the the rules of that magic. Mm-hmm. So now now we've learned that there's rules. Dream just can't do whatever he wants. He has limitations. But then we're introduced to what seems to be some pretty incredible powers. You know. Mm-hmm. So Dream is endless. He, we also learned that that imprisonment was day one to one ratio. It would be like if we were sentenced to life in prison. It felt just as long to him. It's not like it passed by quickly. He was really mad about it. Um, And then we get to meet some interesting characters, almost like going down the rabbit hole a little bit. We, we, we start to run into some familiar characters. Uh, One set of characters is Cain and Abel. um, And Cain is trying to kill Abel. (laughs) Yeah. He, he actually kills him over and over. And then Abel wakes up and gets killed again. And very tragic. Yeah, in fact, the uh, the issue ends with Cain crying. I'm sorry, Abel crying because it's pretty clear that Abel just wants a loving brother, and he's never yeah. gonna have one. Um, oh, yeah, that made me really sad. Even though it's like, why is this story being told? But maybe it will be important. Well, I think so. I think well, I think the reason that we saw Cain and Abel immediately at the start of book two is because they come from what's referred to as the first story. Mm-hmm. And so this is the first thing we're introduced to in Dreamworld. They're they're old. 
They're yeah. really, really old. Also, you're right. They are referred to as the first story. And then when Dream comes back to his castle and sees it ruined, he meets one of his tenants, sort of like his right-hand man was the impression I got. And his tenant calls him the Lord of Stories or something yeah. along those lines. So very yeah. clearly Dream relies on creative story innovation this human thing that we do when we sleep crazy yeah. time um so basically um uh, we get to look at dream a little bit more and then the other major thing that dream does in the second issue is that he calls up the three the, the three maidens the fates the the the, the hecate yes the the maiden the the witches the witches the <laughs> <laughs> you know the young girl the the mother and the crone and they yes. show up and they tease him mercilessly. They're like, ha-ha, dream, ha-ha. And then they have rules too. So Dream's like, well, I went ahead and figured out how to summon you here with the last of my strength. Or he's getting really, he's really, really weak without his items of power. And so he asks them three questions and they answer the three questions. And basically is, where are my three items? <laughs> and they can only give him one answer and he wants to ask more questions and they don't want to tell him or they can't tell him the rules again and off they fly so the issue ends with dream knowing where to start looking for his items of power and knowing that it's going to be it's going to be a kind of a trip it's going to be really hard for him yeah he he actually doesn't really know where they are so so he's he's allowed to ask the uh the three witches one question each and he, his first question is, you know, who has my ruby? I think it was the ruby. I can't remember. I believe it's the sand. And, it was sand. Oh, the sand. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and the witch basically gives him a name. And mm -hmm. then he asks, he's about to ask, like, okay, well, where is this person? And she's like, uh-uh-uh. You already asked me a question. Mm -hmm. And so he realizes, oh, I've got to ask better questions. So So when he asks the second witch who's got his next item, he asks it. He asks it a little bit better, but she basically says a demon has it. And he realizes, oh, drat. I, okay, I know a demon has it, but I don't know which demon. And then when he gets to his third question, I thought for sure he was going to ask a really sneaky question. Mm -hmm. But he basically asked the same question, who has my third item? <laughs> right. And so, so he has a general idea um, who has his items, but he doesn't exactly know who they are or what what they are interesting because this introduces that even though he's endless and even though he's immortal he's certainly capable of messing things up so yeah. he's he's kind of almost like he he reminds me of a greek sort of envisioning of a flawed Im immortal basically you know he has rules yeah. he's flawed he wants revenge he has a wide range of emotions yeah. um dream does and 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 of of the three what I would call targets, he basically decides which one sounds like the least amount of effort to go after first. And I'm really interested in the third issue to to see if that if he made a wise choice or not. Well, we'll find out. It certainly so. seems like he has quite a bit of work to do. So, so. oddest thing in this issue is when Batman. <laughs> Shows up. Oh, there's a, the, there's the a, Justice League. Yeah, there are a little bit of crossovers. There's lots of nods to other literature and stuff like that. But basically, it turns out that one of the items is with the Justice League. And so you see a picture of Batman and uh, the angel guy. Oh, terrible with comics. Um, which yeah. I found to be a bit of a, a, an intrusion, you know, but... It yeah, I, so in episode, I'm sorry, in uh, issue one, I believe it was, we hear about while Dream is in prison, there is a, a normal mortal who calls himself the Sandman and takes up a vigilante role, and it's actually a Sandman crossover from DC Universe as well, mm -hmm. and, and they explain it satisfactorily to me because they say, you know, the universe has a way of self-correcting while Dream is... While Dream is in prison, there's this other guy filling his role to a degree. Yeah, and I thought that made sense as well. Yeah. And then in this one, we see the Justice League. So we, we know this is in the DC universe. Um, I, I, I'm sure that there was a Justice League issue where they probably had an item like that. And they just tied it together. But yeah, I wasn't. I don't, I don't need my superhero mixed in with my horror. 
fantasy thing. <laughs> but it's going to keep happening. I yeah. think uh, particularly a lot of people worked on Sandman um, yeah. and, you know, it's DC Comics. So. Yeah. Well, here, here's the other thing. is like in a lot of places in these two issues, I saw um, characters that were drawn with like famous celebrity heads. And it was it was mostly in the dreams of people, and and it, it bothered me at first because I was like, why is John Wayne appearing in this <laughs> the comic? The Duke, yeah. <laughs> but but then I realized, oh duh, when people dream, they dream about celebrities. So it that's what would be there in the mm-hmm. dream world. They shape the dreams and not the way. Yeah, it, yeah it's not fantasy world. It's dream time. Yeah, and we yeah. know that means crazy time. Um, so. Yes, we we get we get introduced to you know Dreamtime. Um, my favorite panel is in this, uh, of the two issues is in this one is when Dream comes home. He's so weak, he's so tired. He comes home, he opens up the gates, he looks at his castle, and there's this this image of him looking so sad. He's just mm-hmm. he his his mouth kind of falls open. And he just looks drained, and you can tell in that moment how sad he is about the loss of his home and his comforts and his power and um it just words couldn't have translated that i mean like there could have been a panel where he's like this destroys my heart but words defy so there instead there's this image of his broken castle and then an image of his face and he Mm -hmm. just looks desolated yeah Uh, my my favorite panel is actually in uh the first book and it's page 25. It's the top three panels. So so in the first book, as we said, it spanned over 70-something years. And mm-hmm. it's basically like a year for every one or two pages for the yeah. most part. For the most part. They moved along at a very yeah. even pace, it felt but, like. But this particular panel, um, it's three panels next to each other, and it goes 72, 78, 82. So it, it jumps 10 years over three panels, and it's the same shot of Burgess in front in the foreground and he's saying something each time and behind him in the background I think is Alex right Mm -hmm. and Alex and both of them are getting older in each picture and then flanking Alex on either side are guards and the guards change every time we see them yes and so even though Alex is in the background and Burgess is in the front with the dialogue my eyes are drawn to Alex as the focus of these three and he he his face makes the most dramatic change through the three panels. I just really liked the way this one was, was laid out. I think, um, especially, I was really impressed with the first issue and how well it really gave a sense of time. I think that would be really kind of hard to do in a novel form, but or comic book form, but there was, a, it was a heavy feeling of time. Like, yeah. people are visibly changing and... Um, yeah. I, I also thought this panel, this panel actually, I think, has a the beginning of a, a continuity error, or maybe it's a joke, I'm not sure. But the last panel in 1982, there's a guard holding a book, which is It by Stephen King. Yes. And then in the next panel is 1988, and there's a guard still reading It by Stephen King. <laughs> I think I saw that too, and I thought it was just the same guard rereading the book. Yeah. And I, I was like, oh. six years later. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Or he's still reading it. Maybe he never made it all the way through. Or maybe the impression is that it just sits down there in the guard room and they pick it up and like, I'm gonna read it while yeah. sitting next to this scary endless guy. I mean, like, who would guard? Who like that? These men are idiots. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, who I, who would sit I, in a glass dome? I imagine that they're getting paid, and it you know it mentioned that they were supplied with drugs and stuff. So I I think they just kind of said this you know this is the easiest career choice that we could have. We're just sitting here looking at a guy in a glass ball all day. Yeah. Reading books and whatever. Well, it's time to assign homework. Yeah, yeah, give it to me. All right, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna read issues, and those who are following along, please read issues three and four. Yeah, simple enough. Simple enough. The next two issues, and unless our commentators comment and say, this is too much reading, because it was about 77 pages, mm-hmm. all said and done. Um, if it's too much, let us know. We'll change our pace. And the names of the issues, uh, three, is Dream, A Little Dream of Me. And the name of issue four is A Hope in Hell. Mm. So I think we're going to, we're going to, 
I I want to just point out one more little factoid, which I thought I liked a lot because I, I I like little details in books, and uh, if you don't mind, oh, not at all. <laughs> in, in this in the second book, when we're introduced to Cain and Abel, uh, there's this whole big thing about Cain giving Abel a gift, and it turns out to be a a baby gargoyle. Yes. And so at first, Abel names him Irving, <laughs> but apparently that's not appropriate because. It's revealed that all gargoyle names have to start with the letter G. Yeah. Which, Says Kane for no yeah. apparent reason. Just goes on a rant about it. Yeah. So I, I for whatever reason, that, that just stuck out in my head that from now on, if I ever play a role-playing game that has gargoyles in it, all their names are going to start with G. They have to. Or Kane's yeah. going to come get you. Yeah. Because so. he does. He, he murders <laughs> Abel at that point. And then Abel's like really sad. And he's like... Well, I'm going to name you Gregory or something like... What did he name the gargoyle? Goldie. Goldie! Yeah. The, Gregory was the name of the other gargoyle. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm going to name you Goldie, but in my heart, you're, <laughs> you're always going to be Irving. Irving. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really like that part. So. All right. Well... So good, good, very good books. Thank you again for convincing me to, to read them. I, I'm having a good time so far. All right, viewers, did you read along with us? If so, what did you think about the first two issues of Sandman? Let us know. Yes, let us know. All right, now. And, and by the way, Sean, <laughs> Sean is reading along with us as far as I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I saw him in one of his vlogs, so I'm very excited to hear what he has to say. Maybe we'll get a video just for this. Who yeah. knows? Uh, anyway, All right. Sean. Do, do, we have, do we have time for one last topic? Uh, we're, we're stretching it. So here's what I think I would like to do. We're going to talk about the Legend of Korra. But because apparently Sandman is such a lengthy, lengthy thing to talk about, we're going to move the Legend of Korra into its own segment. And that way, people who are watching along or haven't had a chance to watch it yet, they can they, they don't have to be afraid of spoilers, basically. So uh, I did watch it. We're going to talk about it in a completely different video. Look for the video. I'll link it in the informational bar whenever we make it. <laughs> kind of a kind of like a into the future um, broadcast there. But we were we are going to talk about it. It's just going to get its own little thing. It may not even be that long, but I'm sure there's lots of things that we can say about the Legend of Korra because there's lots and lots of Avatar fans out there. I yeah, think so. So we're going to do a two-parter in response to their two-parter. What a coincidence. What a what a funny coincidence that is. Indeed. Well, thank you for joining us for Elaine and Ron have a response to all the things. Yeah. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all next week as well. Yep. So. See you later. Yep. Bye-bye. <laughs>